very happy to introduce you to uh, Alisa Madera. Uh, she's our guest uh, for this afternoon, and she has a bachelor's degree in chemistry from Rutgers University. She's also certified by the, chemist, uh, the American Chemical Society, and currently she's studying the moon uh, as she works toward her PhD. So she's a graduate student in Dr. Juliana Gross' lab in the Earth and Planetary Science Department at Rutgers University. So to learn more about rock chemistry, I am very pleased to introduce you to uh, Alisa Madera. Thank you, Alisa. Thank you. All right, I hope everyone's doing good today. Um, again, welcome to Ask a Geologist. My name is Alyssa Madera, um, and today we're going to rock the elements. It's going to be all about elements and rock chemistry. So a little bit about me. I am a graduate student studying planetary science at Rutgers University. I work with Dr. Juliana Gross. I do have a BA in chemistry, which I completed at Rutgers University. And a fun fact about me, my favorite rock are moon rock. So why are moon rocks my favorite rock? Well, what I'm doing for my graduate research is I'm studying our moon. Um, specifically, I'm studying the thermal history of the moon. And basically all that means is how did the moon formed and what happened while the moon formed? And a simple question that I can ask you is if you go outside tonight and you go look at the moon and I ask you what you could tell me about the moon, well, one observation that you can say is that the moon is light in some spots and dark in other spots. And this is actually because of the different chemistry and rocks that you're seeing. Hey, when you look Do you have a quick sec? So chemistry is in everything. This is the weird thing. Um, chemistry um, 101. Well, result, what is an element? Elements, they out. are the building blocks of our universe. They're in everything that you see. All the way from the stars you see in the sky so, down to yes, the not, fingernail yeah, on I, your I'm hand, elements are in everything. Way, but I'm um, elements are comprised so, of three components. I'm trying they are comprised to of protons, so, neutrons, so and electrons. Is what protons I'm are I'm made asked, of positive I charges. Neutrons have a neutral for, charge, and electrons have a negative charge. Now, this is important my, when my, it comes to yeah, the structure my, of an well, element. Each element uh, is comprised of an atom, and in this atom you have a central now. nucleus which um, holds the protons and the yeah, neutrons, and then you have that. electrons Which's, that orbit the nucleus, kind of like the planets so orbiting our sun. So this is a little yeah, image certainly. of an oxygen um, atom, and in the center of the oxygen atom you have the protons and the neutrons in the nucleus, and then you have these electrons that are kind of floating around, and you can kind of compare this to the planets in our solar system. You could say that the sun is the nucleus of our solar system and the planets are the electrons that are kind of floating around. that was kind of strange. So I went so where do elements come from? Well, billions and billions and billions of years ago, uh, there was something called the Big Bang. And what happened in the Big Bang is it scattered tiny particles all throughout the universe, and eventually these tiny particles came together as what we know as atoms. And eventually these atoms came together and formed what we know as elements. And eventually these elements came together and formed what we know as stars and our planet. So elements came from this big explosion that happened billions and billions and billions of years verify the computer name and domain that you're trying to connect to so today we organize the elements in what we know as the periodic table um in 1969 dimitri mendeleev invented the periodic table and he first organized the periodic table in order of atomic mass today we organize the periodic table in something called atomic number um when dimitri mendeleev first invented the periodic okay. table he actually left blank spaces in between the elements for the discovery of new elements, which we have done today. So the periodic table of elements. Each element gets its own atomic symbol. Um, each element, so for this example, this is helium. Uh, the atomic symbol for helium is H8. Uh, it has a mass number of four and it has an atomic number of two. So what the mass number is, is the number of protons plus neutrons in the nucleus. And the atomic number is actually the number of protons, which evidently also equals the number of electrons that an atom has. And it's kind of like a math problem. So if I told you that there was a mass number of four, so two protons and two electron, uh, two neutrons, and I told you that helium also had an atomic number of two, meaning it had two protons, all you have to do is take 
or minus two, and you get the number of neutrons. And that tells you that this helium atom has two protons and two neutrons. So the periodic table of elements, this is what you would see if you looked at the periodic table of elements. Um, it's organized again in the a biatomic number of each element. Um, and what's kind of cool about the periodic table is you can look at it through rows and you can look at it through columns. So the rows are actually called periods and the columns are actually called groups. So each period tells you a little something. So periods of the elements on a periodic table can actually tell you what is the atomic radius of each element that you're looking at. So if you go down the periodic table, uh, each element starts to increase in atomic radius size. And if you go across the periodic table from left to right, it'll tell you that each element on that periodic table starts to decrease in atomic radius. And if you look at the groups going down the periodic table, they each display similar chemical characteristics. So if you look at the first set of elements on the periodic table, such as the alkali metals, well, alkali metals are actually very, very highly reactive with water. Yeah, and if you look at this image I have on the PowerPoint yeah, slides right here, this is actually here an alkali metal reacting with water, here, so and you can, can see smoke coming from here as well. Um, I remember <laughs> from my chem class, an experiment that we did uh, back in high school where they took a sodium metal and they put a drop of water on the sodium metal and the sodium metal exploded. Now, obviously, when you think of sodium, you would think of something like table salt. And when you put salt inside something that's liquid or something has water, it doesn't explode. Well, that's because the sodium in the sodium salt is paired with a chlorine and it takes away that highly reactive. But if you were to find sodium out in nature, which you wouldn't find sodium out in nature by itself, um, it would react very highly with water. So what elements make up the Earth? Well, a lot of elements make up the Earth. You can look at it from perspective of the oceans. You can look at it from the perspective of living matter, such as yourself or plants. You can look at it from the perspective of the atmosphere, and then you can look at it from perspective of rocks itself, the solid Earth. Um, but what you're looking at is not exactly what you're seeing. You don't look at the oceans and say, oh, there's this many oxygen, there's this many magnesium. You don't look at plants and say, oh, that, that's a lot of carbon in there. Actually, what you're seeing is this. You're seeing water flowing. You're seeing clouds in the sky. You're seeing plants in front of you. And then if you were to look at videos of volcanoes, you would see hot lava coming down. But in these images, there's actually tiny, 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 tiny little elements. So what you may not see is actually there. So what Basically, what I'm saying is that elements are everywhere in everything that you see, even though you can't see them with your very eye. So let's break down some familiar rocks that we know. Um, this is an example of quartz. Quartz is made up of silicon and two oxygen. Um, so you may, this is a, a example of quartz right here. It's a pretty big mineral crystal size, but what you see all the time is actually something you can go down to the shore and pick up with your hand. You can pick up beach sand. And beach sand is primarily made up of quartz, tiny, tiny, tiny grains of quartz. Um, what's cool about quartz is that quartz is organized in this atomic structure right here. But if I was to take silicon and oxygen and I was to just shock it and not let it time to organize in these little tiny like element structure, you would actually get glass. And so if you go to your window right now, there's glass right there. That's just basically, if you wanna see, those are elements frozen in time that haven't given frozen in time that haven't been given enough time to organize in something like quartz. Um, if you're a New Jersey native, you can actually go down to Cape May, New Jersey, and Cape May, New Jersey is known for Cape May diamonds. And there's not actually diamonds in Cape May, but what it is is that um, in, the, in the sand of Cape May beaches, you, if you go really early in the morning before, you know, throughout the day when the waves have time to wash the sand up, you can find big, big pieces of quartz. Um, and of course, when people saw these, because they looked like diamonds, they thought they were diamonds, but they're actually quartz minerals. Uh, breaking down olivine. So olivine is really important because olivine is one of the most common minerals in our solar system. Um, it is primarily magnesium, iron, and then silica and oxygen atoms. Um, if you were to look at uh, olivine with magnesium in it, you'd be looking at a forthright mineral. And if you were to look at an olivine with iron in it, you'd be looking at a phthalate mineral. And even though this is technically the same mineral, just because it has different elements in it, it actually creates two different colors and it has different, it has the same chemical properties, but it's 
basically you can have with different elements you can basically have same mineral but you can have different properties as well and if you were to break down something like um graphite versus diamond well graphite and diamond are actually made of up of the same element carbon um, but they're formed in two different areas so graphite you would see in something like a pencil a pencil you would write with every single day but it's really soft it's gray you know it's so common but carbon actually also makes up one of the hardest and rarest minerals that you would find in the world today and that's a diamond and the reason why carbon makes up two different two opposite spectrums of minerals is because they're formed in different environments so graphite is formed more to the surface and diamond is formed deep and deep deep into the earth in a high pressure areas and that tells you that elements react elements specifically in minerals react in different environments in different ways so franklin township new jersey is actually the fluorescent mineral capital of the world and basically what that means is that in these caverns specifically in these mines there's minerals that react to uv light and these minerals react to uv light specifically by the elements called activators in these minerals that minerals that make them forever so what i can show you with that is i have an example right here so this is actually from sterling hill mine i don't know if you can see this kind of bright this is a uv light that i have and these are the activators in this rock from Sterling Hill Mine that are fluorescing with this UV light. So this is pretty cool because this is something that you can go see for yourself. You can go see these fluorescent minerals that are, are fluorescing because of the elements that they have in their chemical structure yourself. Um, they have open tours and everything for you to go see. All right. Anyone have questions? Um, Alisa, there, there will be some questions in, in the Google Docs. So you can okay. not share your screen and go to full view, and then you will find the questions there. All right. So, So Nia from New Jersey actually has a great question. Uh, she asks, are there different types of rocks other than the three base rocks when you get closer to the Earth's core? And this is actually a really interesting and cool question. So the main three rock types are igneous, metamorph, and sedimentary rocks. But as you go deeper into the Earth, deeper into the Earth to the core, you don't get different types of rocks. You get different subtypes of these rocks, of different subtypes of igneous and metamorph rocks. Um, that are created under high pressure and high temperature environments kind of like when i was showing you the example of graphite versus diamond and then when you get to the core itself it's basically just a big mixture of all these metals not a specific type of rock gary from flanders new jersey would like to know how do the fungi and lichen extract mineral from rocks and this is also a really cool question so the way this happened is by physical weathering and chemical weathering of the rocks themselves and the lichens are doing this and when i say physical weathering and chemical weathering basically what the lichens are doing they're breaking down the rocks physical weathering just means that they're growing on top of the rocks and they're breaking down the minerals in the rocks chemical weathering means that they're using some type of chemical in their system to break down the minerals in the rocks themselves um crews from toms river new jersey would like to know what makes geodes sparkle so geos sparkle because of the facets of minerals that are inside them and the way that the light hits these minerals and is reflected off. Um, see Mary from Scotch Plains, New Jersey. Um, what new equipment would you invent? Uh, so this is a pretty cool question. Uh, I would invent a drill to make it to the core of the earth. So we can kind of, you know, speculate what is beneath their feet and what is actually going down into the core of the earth. And sometimes we're able to sample from different rocks and magmas um, what's happening deep down beneath their feet. But there's so many unanswered questions. So I would, I would invent something to actually go down there and see and bring back this evidence from all these questions that we have about the core of the earth and then take this tool and apply it to different planetary bodies and different, different types of 
of planetary structures that are kind of like Earth that we don't know what's going on in there as well. Um, Mary from Scotch Plains also asked, have you been to the New Jersey Mineral Show in Edison, New Jersey? I have not been to the Mineral Show, but I would like to go one time. Are there chemical scales like the other scales hardness, maybe like percentage of chemical XYZ? So the different structure of molecules that make up a mineral is what gives minerals their different crystal shapes, uh, hardness, being able to incorporate different size elements. So yes, how minerals are structured down to a molecular level is unique to mineral itself. Um, Oh, I think I answered the wrong question. I'm sorry about that. Is the shape of a molecule in a mineral the same in all rocks that have them? Actually, yes. So the different structure of molecules that make up a mineral is what gives minerals their different crystal shapes, hardness, being able to incorporate different size elements. So how the minerals are structured down to a molecular level is actually really unique to the mineral itself. Um, for olivine, the example I gave in the slide, when describing olivine, you can sometimes describe it by how much magnesium is in there and you say this is the magnesium number. What new ways could there to be to group rocks and minerals? Um, so I don't really know what new ways there could be to group rocks and minerals, but maybe in the future during our planetary exploration, we might exploration, we might find you know rocks and minerals that we cannot place into the classification system that we have today. So there might be a new way to group rocks and minerals. Um, does the same color in different minerals mean there are the same or are chemical or shared chemicals in those minerals? Not at all. So if you look at quartz and diamonds, both are clear and very, very hard, but they're composed of entirely different elements and they're actually formed in entirely different environments. So the color of different minerals does not mean that they share the same chemicals inside them at, at all. Okay. Do we have any other questions? I don't know if I see the chat. So there are a few more um, on that document. I'm not sure if you see them all. Um, you can refresh your page and see if they come up. If not, we can read them to you. Okay, let's see. Okay, so I have, are scientists still discovering new elements? So I don't know exactly when the last element was discovered, um, but a lot of the elements still have been discovered, but there's a couple blank spaces on the periodic table left for elements uh, to be placed. Um, I guess people are still in the works of that, but I don't know exactly, uh, I don't know when they will discover the newest element. Um, and yes, to answer the next questions, new elements can be created. So what are man-made elements and how are they created? So man-made elements are elements that are created in a laboratory setting and they're not formed out in nature by themselves. Um, so that's kind of like the blank spaces that Dimitri Mendeleev left on the periodic table, not just for elements to be discovered out in nature, but for elements to be discovered in laboratory settings themselves. Can you find quartz or diamonds in other beaches in New Jersey other than Cape May? Um, yes, you can find quartz. Uh, like I said, if you go down to Seaside Beach or you go down to any beach, actually, the sand itself is going to be made up of tiny, 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 tiny quartz grains that just look like regular sand. Um, so why did I decide to become a geologist? So when I was doing my uh, bachelor's degree in chemistry, um, I had to do a senior research project and I wanted to study planetary science. And I was paired with Dr. Juliana Gross, who took me on and we decided to uh, study the chemistry of space. And coming back into graduate school, I decided to continue that project. And now I'm working with her as a geologist in the Earth and Planetary Science Department, studying the chemistry of the moon. What is the coolest part about being a graduate student? Um, I get to look at moon rocks all day. I get to study things that uh, you only get to speculate and see in space. I think that's the coolest part about being a graduate student. And the process of learning itself, I learn something new every single day. So I think that's, that's pretty cool.
what is my favorite mineral? I would have to say quartz would probably be my favorite mineral because you can have so many different colors of quartz, um, rose quartz specifically, because I just love the color pink. Um, there's plenty of different colored quartz out there. Uh, if able to collect you expect to find new elements in the moon? Um, I don't expect to find new elements in the moon. Um, so if able to collect moon samples, do you expect to find new elements? I would not expect to find new elements in the moon, um, just based off you know, what we know. Um, pretty much the moon is very similar to Earth. So the elements that we have on Earth are these elements that I expect to find on the moon. Do you have a favorite element? Uh, I do have a favorite element, actually. My favorite element is gold, not because of gold itself, uh, because of the atomic symbol AU. And I think that's that's pretty funny that gold has like the atomic symbol AU. Um, just a little chemistry joke. How do we know what types of minerals make up the rocks on other planets? So. So how do we know what type of minerals makes up the rocks on other planets? Well, we look at meteorites. Um, we look, so when we study meteorites, which are basically rock samples from outer space, we can kind of get the general idea of what rocks are out there in our universe. Um, and this is really important for understanding, you know, the formation of our solar system, the formation of our planet Earth itself, and what happened so many years ago when these rocks were being uh, created and these minerals were being created. Marilyn would like to know, how long do glowstones last? I don't think I know the answer to that question. Erica would like to know what is the hardest rock? The hardest rock, um, I would say the hardest mineral itself would be diamonds. Diamonds are definitely, definitely the hardest mineral on the hardness scale. Um, that's because of the chemical structure and the way that the carbon atoms are arranged in the diamond itself. What Jonathan would like to know, what inspired you to go from chemistry to planetary science? So when I graduated uh, Rutgers with my chem degree, I decided to go work in a lab for a little bit. Um, it was fun, but I definitely was more into answering questions that I want to ask about our universe and I want to ask about our planets and I want to ask about, you know, what's out there rather than working in a lab playing with chemicals. Um, so coming back to, you know, Rutgers and studying planetary science was a big step because it's something that obviously I am familiar with, but a whole different ball field of what I can get into because I'm going from, you know, using acids on something, you know, uh, to create something rather than, you know, asking a question about what is the chemical structure in, of the moon and how these things formed on the moon. Are we really made out of stardust? Technically, technically we are made out of stardust. So um, when atoms came together uh, after the Big Bang, uh, they started to come together and they formed stars. And what happens in stars is something that's called nuclear fusion and Specifically, hydrogen atoms will come together and they'll fuse together to make heavier atoms, such as like helium. And then helium's atoms will come together and, and those atoms will fuse together and they'll start to create heavier elements. And eventually what happens is that in these stars, nuclear fusion happens, nuclear fusion happens, and they create so many heavy elements that they get too heavy and too pressurized and they explode. And this explosion actually creates even heavier elements. And then what happens is, those elements come together and they start forming uh, rocks and they start forming heavier elements. And then after a time, these rocks start together and they start forming our solar system and they start forming planets. And then there's a whole nother ball field out there on studying, you know, where did life come from and how did we get here? But at the end of the day, we're all just those elements that were formed in these stars and, and through this nuclear fusion process, billions and billions of years over time. What do would like to know? What do moon rocks, Erica would like to know, what do moon rocks feel and look like? Um, well, they look like rocks that you, they feel like rocks that you would pick up in the backyard. Um, you know, all rocks kind of, 
feel the same uh, and they look the same. Specifically though, um, if you were to look at the moon and those dark sections in the moons, they're something called basalts and they're actually formed from magma deep in the earth. Not the same magma that you would find in volcanoes on earth today, but the similar rock classification uh, that you would find in volcanoes today. So if you were to pick up something like a, a volcanic rock from like Hawaii and you were to pick up like a volcanic rock from the moon, they, yes, they come from different locations, but they're kind of similar in a way because, you know, the moon and the earth are very, very similar uh, in elements and, and rock structure. Um, let's see. In the future, where do you see yourself after PH day? Um, so hopefully after, you know, I'm actually going for my master's, um, but I would like to continue on to getting my PhD. And after I get my PhD, I would love to continue doing research in planetary sciences, um, maybe continuing studying the moon and, 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 uh, yeah, come back to a university setting and hopefully be able to teach a lot of students, maybe you one day, um, planetary science. Do you want to go to the moon? I would love to go to the moon, but I'm actually uh, kind of afraid of heights. I don't like that feeling when you drop down, you know, from a roller coaster and you get that butterfly feeling in. Okay. Let's see. Did I miss any questions from anybody? You can check your uh, private, the, like the personal chat, like they, they could have email you some questions there directly. Okay, let's see. Would you go meteorite hunting in Antarctica if given the chance? So actually my advisor, Dr. Yuliana Gross, I believe she's giving uh, a chat in a couple weeks, so be on the lookout for her. She has gone meteorite hunting in Antarctica um, and she has so many great stories about it. And from what her stories uh, that she's told me, they, they're actually really cool and really interesting. Uh, very, very hard work, but the reward is, is great. So I would definitely, definitely go meteorite hunting in Antarctica if given the chance. Um, I've only gone camping a couple times. Uh, it's funny, right? I'm a geologist, but I've only gone camping a couple times. So I would kind of need to prep myself a little bit, but it's, it's, this sounds like a very cool and rewarding experience. Let's see. How do geologists know how old things are? Well, geologists know how old um, rocks are specifically from the elements that are in these rocks. Uh, elements can tell you a, a lot of information. Um, sometimes elements, they have a different, uh, if you look at the periodic table, I told you about the atomic mass number and how you can take the atomic number and subtract it from the atomic mass number, and that'll tell you how many neutrons are in the atom. Well, sometimes elements um, have different mass numbers for the same element. That means that they have different neutrons in their element, and that actually is called isotope. And some isotopes decay over time. And by understanding and studying, you know, what, de what decay means is that they, they lose either protons or neutrons over time and they turn into something, another element. And what that means is that if you study the elements that are in these rocks that are decaying, these radioactive elements, um, you can actually relate that back to how old this rock is or how old when this was when it formed and that'll tell you how old things are or how old these rocks are so diamonds form deep into the earth um, by lots and lots and lots and lots of pressure and then the way we see diamonds is they explode out out of the earth uh, through something called kimberlite and kimberlites is just a type of uh, a type of rock that we have found and so you know finding where these kimberlites are and finding where these big, big explosions are are important because diamonds are so rare 
So finding the diamonds are really rare because they're not formed on the surface of the earth. They're actually formed deep, deep, and deep into the earth. Um, what are some of the best places to go rock and mineral hunting in New Jersey once we are allowed out of the house again? Um, so I actually have been wanting to go to this one place. It's not technically a rock and mineral hunting place, but if you are local to New Jersey, you can go to, I think it's Marlboro, New Jersey, and you can go walk the lake beds and you can actually get fossils from uh, teeth and little tiny, 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 tiny teeth fossils from millions and millions of years ago. Or you can go to Cape May and go pick up the Cape May diamonds, which is pretty cool. Um, sometimes when you go hiking, if you go hiking in mountain ranges, mountain ranges are actually rock formations. And you might be able to find cool looking structures and cool looking rocks within those ranges itself. What is the oldest rock found on earth? So it's very hard to, you know, study rocks that are have been around since the earth was formed. And that's because rocks themselves are, you know, mass is neither created or destroyed. So rocks themselves, when they're on the earth, they're recycled a lot. So the oldest rock found on earth, I believe it was from back when the continental crust, like the crust beneath our feet, was first formed. Uh, so that was maybe like 4.0 billion years ago. Um, by the way, I checked it out. So what do you mean that rocks get recycled a lot? So Earth is pretty unique because we have something that's called tectonic plates. And there's something called subduction tectonic plates. And what that is, is that the crust of our Earth is constantly being subducted under uh, other crusts on our Earth. And this crust that's being subducted is going down deep into the earth and then it's being remelted and reworked and then it comes back up out of the earth and forms a new crust. And this is something constant that's constantly happening. So the rocks that you find beneath, rocks that you find beneath their feet and the land they, that you walk on today is actually going to be recycled crust. Meaning that it's constantly in rotation and, and being reused to make new crust and new rock. Uh, Can minerals be radioactive and harmful? Um, so some minerals can be uh, radioactive and harmful. So I'm sure everyone's heard of maybe uranium. So uranium uh, can be a radioactive mineral. Um, and it glows like a really cool green color. Um, so, you know, minerals that have uranium as they radioactively decay, they, they, it can be harmful. Um, but most minerals uh, are, are not radioactive and, and not harmful at all. What is your most memorable experience as a geologist? So I'm still starting off in my geology career. Um, I'm a first year as graduate student, so I'm still in the process of learning a lot of things, kind of like you were learning. Um, uh, my most memorable experience as a geologist um, I think I'm still working working up to it. Um, I love studying moon rocks every single day. I believe I'm going to be visiting NASA within the next couple months. And that's just, just a big, big goal for me uh, on my bucket list to, to go visit NASA and go see NASA. Um, so I wanna say, you know, I'm working my way up to that and that will definitely probably be the most memorable experience I have as a geologist two days to be able to visit such a great facility like NASA. I believe we have another question. So, Joan would like to know, what methods or techniques have you used to study the moon only by meteorites? Okay, so this is a pretty cool question. So. You know, how, how do we study the moon? Uh, to put it in very simple terms, um, there once was a time when NASA decided to, you know, put the first man on the moon and collect rock samples and bring them back. Um, so then there's also a time where meteorites fall 
sky and they land on the moon and sometimes these meteorites uh, land on the moon, sorry, land on earth and sometimes these meteorites come from the moon. So that's how I'm able to study the moon physically. Um, I like to, so one of the ways, one of the techniques that we use to study the moon and get the chemical structure of the moon is by taking very, very thin, thin sections, uh, thin slices of these big rock pieces that we have from the moon and looking at them through a microscope. Um, looking at the different minerals that are in these thin sections and then looking at the different uh, texture that these minerals are coming together in this thin section. And then putting these thin sections into a machine that is able to tell me what elements are actually in this rock sample itself. Um, so you don't, so it, the other question is, is do you study the moon only by meteorites? And the answer to that is no. So Apollo samples, you know, when Apollo went to the moon and, and came back with samples, this is really important because these were taking at specific locations on the moon and it gives us kind of a reference of where these, these samples were taken. So when you look at something like a meteorite and it, you know, we, we pair it to the moon and we say it came from the moon, we don't actually know where it came from on the moon. Um, but maybe, you know, sometimes we're able to pair these meteorites with, uh, you, know, you know, maybe we're gonna be able to pair these meteorites with an Apollo sample and, and that'll tell us, you know, like this sample came from this part of the moon and this meteorite came from this part of the moon. what kind of rocks are on the moon, something like basaltic rocks. So the kind of rocks that are on the moon, um, it's they're very interesting. So there's this type of rock. So when you look at the moon and you see uh, uh, the white part of the moon that's reflecting back at you and it makes the moon look look really white, what you're actually kind of see, what you're seeing is a rock called anorthite. And anorthite um, is very, very light in, uh, light in color. And when the sun reflects on the anorthite rock on the moon, it reflects back as really white. So that's why when you look up at the moon, you see something really, really white. Um, but anorthite on Earth is actually rare. So then when you look at the dark spots on the moon and you see the black rock, that's actually um, igneous rock. Um, and that's that's rock formed from uh, magma uh, that has come up onto the moon and, and solidified. Um, so there's a bunch of different types of rocks that are on the moon, not just basaltic rocks. Um, there's a bunch of different minerals that are on the moon, not just like anorthite, but the rocks that are formed in basaltic rocks at all. Favorite chem class. Jonathan would like to know what is my favorite chem class at Rutgers? Uh, so this is going to be a little weird. Um, my favorite chem class at Rutgers was actually organic chemistry. Um, so organic chemistry is a little bit different than inorganic chemistry, which is what you know we're studying with geology. Um, organic chemistry, uh, it, it's a lot harder, and I think that's why, uh, than the other chem classes, I'm sorry. It was a lot harder and a lot of information uh, and something that you know I, I don't see myself getting into now. Um, but it was pretty cool to see you know uh, the different chemical pathways that they kind of allowed me to see, and that's why it was my favorite chem class at Rutgers. Kevin would like to know, is it possible to find a harder substance than diamond deeper in the earth? Well, like I said in the earlier questions, what would be um, a new equipment that I would like to see? And maybe if we do have a drill that can go to the core of the earth, we might be able to find something that's harder than a diamond, but we, we just don't have that information right now. So right now, diamonds are the hardest substance that we have uh, to date and it is found deep here. What is the most important thing about being a geologist? So the most important thing about being a geologist is just, you know, there's so there's so many things you can do with geology. Um, you can study the oceans, you can study planets, you can study, um, you know, the ground, the ground beneath your feet, you know, the sand on the beaches. So the most important important thing about being a geologist, I feel like, is that there's not just one little field in geology, there's so much in geology. And that you, you know, there's always something that you can learn, something that you may not know. Okay, let's go back to the group chat. I think 
I answered all the questions. Do Okay, thank, thank you, Alyssa, for, for the talk. This is great. If you have any more questions, you can post them, send them quickly. But I wanted to announce that um, next week, next Tuesday, April 14th, we will have Chris Rowan, uh, also from the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences, and the topic will be plate tectonics. So I know there were some questions from our second session with Dr. Lepre that might be get an answer uh, might be, you might be able to get an answer for them next week. So stay tuned with us. And uh, any questions anywhere here? I think one more just came in from Jonathan. Other than our moon, is there another planet moon in our solar system that you'd like to visit or study? Um, so I would actually like to go all the way to Pluto. like. I would venture out far, far, far into our solar system to the outer edge and go see what Pluto is about. Um, because I think that's that's something that, you know, may not get answered in our lifetime. So it's it's a big question. You know, if I could go anywhere, it would be Pluto and see see what is on the edge of our, our you know, obviously there's other things out in this, our solar system, but see what what is out there as far as Pluto goes. Okay, hey, yeah, I, I think that that's all for the questions today. Remember that this will be recorded and posted via our Facebook page. Thank you, everybody. And thank, thank you for this great talk. Thank you.